My next guest really needs no introduction. In 2007, the Walt Disney Company declared him a Disney legend, the highest honor the company bestows on an individual. He was employed by Disney back in 1957, becoming the first black animator to be hired by the company. His work has been entertaining audiences of all ages from the 1950s all the way to the 21st century. He has personally worked with seemingly everyone from Walt Disney to Steve Jobs. Outside of Disney, he has worked on Fat Albert, Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and even Sesame Street. As Gary Trousdale puts it, he pretty much is the Forrest Gump of animation. He has made recent appearances on shows like The View and Pawn Stars. You can find more detail on his incredible life in this wonderful documentary released back in 2016 called Floyd Norman and Animated Life which is available on Blu-ray, and it's currently streaming on the Criterion channel. This podcast is being released on June 22nd, which marks the 87th birthday of our guest, yet he shows no signs of slowing down. He draws and posts on social media almost every day. Please welcome to the show an exceptional man, Mr. Floyd Norman. Floyd, are you there? Yes. Hey, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. Okay. There's so much that I would love to ask you about. I actually want to start two years ago. You were actually one, uh, on an episode of one of my favorite shows, Pawn Stars. You remember uh, being on this show? Yes, I do indeed. Uh, uh, in, in, in beautiful downtown Las Vegas. I'm Floyd Norman. The Floyd Norman. The Floyd Norman, cartoonist since the 1950s, even worked with Walt Disney himself. Okay, that must have been... Uh... It was exciting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm a little overwhelmed. I mean... Um... So was I. <laughs> hey, Corey, this is like one of the main animators for Disney forever. Oh, wow. So do you remember Roger Rabbit when you were a kid? Yeah. This guy drew it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have buddies with Jessica Rabbit tattooed on him. <laughs> Do you remember the items that you brought? Uh, vaguely. I, I remember bringing some uh, original Roger Rabbit comic strips. Yes, that was the most interesting thing you brought. And I would be curious to if you could explain what those were and what was your work involvement working on that. Well, well we're going all the way back in time, back to the uh, early 80s when a project that had been percolating at Disney for a number of years, uh, an adaptation uh, of Roger Rabbit, uh, written by Gary Wolf, and they wanted to make a feature film. They thought it would be a perfect fit for Disney because it was live action and animation. But for some reason, the film never could uh, get moving. And it wasn't until the new management came in in the early 80s, uh, uh, Michael Eisner, Frank Wells brought new management to Disney, and they made a connection with Steven Spielberg and Bob Zemeckis to do a joint production. Uh, Amblin and Disney would uh, work together on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And so a, a very uh, innovative film, a very exciting film. And to go along with that feature-length motion picture, we decided we would do a Roger Rabbit comic strip that would appear in the newspapers. And so we, we did a number of things on Roger, you know, graphic novels and, and all sorts of things. But one of those items on our list was a daily comic strip based on the Roger character and, and the characters in the motion picture. And so um, we worked on this, uh, created a number of comic strips, Unfortunately, for one reason or another, the comic strip never went anywhere, never took off. And so years later, I discovered these original uh, original Roger Rabbit comic, comic uh, strips that were on my shelf. <laughs> and they were one of the items I took to Pawn Stars to, um, to basically um, find out their value or what, what somebody might pay for them. So... 
that's how that Roger Rabbit thing came about and the uh, being one of the items on Pawn Stars. Yeah. So I, I am curious, how did you enjoy your time working on comics? Did you enjoy it anywhere near to the level of working on animated films? Yeah, you know, it's funny. People often ask that question about what did you enjoy more? And, and I don't regard it as enjoying one thing more or less than something else. Uh, actually, I began my career as a young kid while still in high school working on a comic book. Uh, and, and that was my introduction to being a professional artist and writer working, working in comics. Now, of course, I had a love for animation and Walt Disney in particular. So I always knew that one day, sooner or later, I would be headed for Hollywood and the Walt Disney Studio. But to answer your question, it's all storytelling. It doesn't matter whether it's a book, a comic book, or a motion picture, or a TV show. It's all storytelling. And I think I enjoy all of it equally. Um, I, I don't really have a preference uh, one thing over another. Might sort of slightly favor the, the format of feature-length animated films, only because that affords you more opportunities. You, you usually have a bigger budget. You usually have more time. And you, you can usually create something a good deal more compelling. So if I was to give a nod to anything, it might be the animated feature film. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, animated features, you know, of course, are, you know, you're, you're a big part of your career and I love them. But, you know, I yeah. am also the the comics are such a fascinating part of the Disney brand that doesn't get talked about a lot. I'm just curious. Did you ever yeah. meet your fellow Disney legend, Carl Bartz? Oh, yes, I did. Uh, on any number of occasion of occasions, I, I, I was very lucky to uh, meet with Mr. Barks. I was a huge admirer, admirer of, of his work. I read uh, his stories when I was, a, when I was a child. I, I, I remember, you know, growing up in, in my hometown of Santa Barbara and reading those wonderful stories that Carl had written. So when many years later, when I became uh, a grown up and a professional, I was, uh, it was an honor to meet Mr. Barks. And on some occasions, they even joined him uh, at dinner. Uh, I was there wow. when Carl Barks was made a Disney legend. Uh, I remember that day in particular. So, yeah, yeah, I, I've been, I think I've been quite fortunate to have had the opportunity to meet many of my heroes. Yeah, that, that is so cool. Um, do you, you know, one of the things that interests me about Roger Rabbit as a movie was that it was really the first, quote, Disney film that actually had to be animated outside of the Burbank lot at Disney, you know, outside of Disney. It was, of yeah. course, animated in London by uh, Richard Williams. Studio. Right. I am yeah. curious, did you ever get offered to work on that? Did you ever have any opportunity? Well, to be honest, uh, I, I knew about the Roger project from the beginning and um, even attended a number of meetings over at uh, Steven Spielberg's company, Amblin, which was located on the Universal Studio lot, not that far from Disney. So we made many trips over to Amblin. Uh, I never did meet Mr. Spielberg, uh, ironically enough. <laughs> He's just about yeah. the only person you didn't meet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, I've met a lot of people, but I, uh, every time I was at the Amblin Studios, Steven Spielberg was never there. So I never met him back, back in those days. But to answer your question, uh, I had a job working in Disney publishing, working on books and comics, and pretty much anything that was in print. And I knew that there was no way in the world I could do both print and motion pictures. So I had to make a choice. And I remember speaking with Andreas Deja, uh, who was headed uh, to London to work on the film uh, with Richard Williams. And I remember telling him, oh, I wish so much that I could join you guys in London. I would so love to work on what I knew then was going to be a groundbreaking uh, motion picture. Uh, I couldn't do that because I had a, I had a job at Disney Publishing. I had responsibilities there. And so 
I had to just, uh, and yet I was able to be in touch with the filmmakers. So in one sense, I was able to share this, you know, creative process because I continued to stay in touch with the animation personnel. And eventually when we added a unit here in Southern California, because the, the uh, picture had a hard and fast deadline, the deadline was set when the film had to be released to theaters and Richard Williams and his team over in London, uh, they could not crank out the animated footage quickly enough. So we had to establish a second unit here in Burbank to do the rest of the animation. So I would go to that studio because after all, it was nearby. So uh, in many ways, I, I felt really connected to Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, even though I never actually worked on the animated segments myself. Yeah, you may not have worked on Roger Rabbit, but you did work on that other great Disney movie that combined animated and live action, which was Mary Poppins back in 1964. You have any fond memories of working on that? Uh, many, many fond memories. <laughs> I guess one could, could speak uh, hours about that uh, amazing project. Uh, I mean, it was it was an epic <laughs> endeavor, and and that began long before the picture even moved into production. Uh, so much there's so much story to to this whole Mary Poppins episode. You might right. uh, remember that a motion picture was made, a film entitled Saving Mr. Banks, was all right. about was all about Walt Disney trying to convince the author, P.L. Travers, to allow him to make an animated adaptation of Mary Poppins. And uh, there was so much <laughs> that went on there that it, it, even, uh, it even engendered uh, another motion picture. But the whole process of doing Mary Poppins back in the 60s, it was a very a exciting project. I would say it was one of those projects that really uh, that Walt Disney probably enjoyed more than most of the things he was doing. It was a very exciting motion picture. It was a very big motion picture. It, it involved a lot of people, a lot of talent. It involved both live action and animation. Of course, our stars were Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke and just a marvelous cast. Uh, and all of us as animators were also involved because we had to create the animated segments. Uh, and of course we couldn't even do this until after the live action was shot. It's one of the things when you do, when you're combining live action with animation, you have to wait until the live action is, is photographed before you can begin your work. So you can't get out ahead of live action. You have to follow live action. So after the shooting wrapped up on Mary Poppins, uh, I think we were on that production for at least another year doing wow. the animation. Yeah, it took, it took about a year to complete the animation, uh, which had to be composited with the live action film uh, before the film could be completed. But I do remember it being a very exciting project. Uh, I loved working on Mary Poppins. I loved working with my t with my team of animation professionals, along with our live action counterparts. Uh, it was just a splendid collaboration, and we had a ball making that film. And I always knew it was going to be a big hit. We just felt deep down inside that Mary Poppins was going to be a very special motion picture. Yeah, and. It was. And is it significantly harder as an animator to work on a film that a live action film that combines animation as opposed to just an animated movie? Well, there are challenges when you are combining animation with live action. I, I, I wouldn't say it's any more difficult to work on a, uh, a hybrid film like that. I would say you have to be you have to be a good deal more meticulous in terms of matching your animation to the live action. One of the things most notable that generally when you're working with compositing live action with animation, the animation has to be done on ones. And that is for every live action frame of film, 
there has to be an animated uh, uh, frame of film generated. And that means our animation, which is usually done on twos, that is two frames for every, you know, for every, every image that goes on the film, we, we do our animation on twos. When you're compositing with live action, you have to do the animation on ones. That means uh, you have to draw literally every frame of film because it has to composite perfectly with its live action counterpart. So in that sense, it's a good deal more work. It's a more meticulous, a little bit more tedious, but uh, it is just as creative. But uh, it's always a challenge. And uh, I think even now uh, in, in the modern age where animation can be composited digitally, I think it's still a lot of work when you're trying to uh, put those two pieces of film together. Of course, today there's no film. Everything, everything is digital, but it still involves a good deal of work. Yeah, I mean, and you've had, you know, your work and your life, you've had an exceptional, you know, career that, you know, I wish we could go all over it with our time. But the good <laughs> news is, the good yeah. news is we don't have to because you have a fantastic documentary that was made about you. Um, I've seen it twice. It's great. Wow. It's called Floyd Norman, the animated life. So yeah. I'm curious, you know, like who was the lucky person who approached you to get that film made and how did they get the job? Well, you know, it's one of those things, but you know, the way films began <laughs> sometimes is quite surprising and sometimes quite unexpected. What happened was uh, it was during the San Diego Comic Con, a big comic book convention that happens every year out here in Southern California. And I was going over to congratulate the filmmaker because he had just completed a documentary on the life of the famous poster artist, Drew Struzan. Wow. And so that's when I first met the filmmaker, Eric Sharkey. And as I was speaking with Eric, he was looking for a follow-up project, like what would he do next? And somebody mentioned, well, here's your next project right here, yeah, pointing to me. And the filmmaker thought, hey, wait a minute. Maybe this guy's life and career just might make a good documentary. And so he went back to New York, met with his partner, and a few... A few weeks later, they gave me a telephone call. I was at the Walt Disney Studio. They called me up and said, we would like to do a documentary of your life and career. And I said, uh, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and they were determined to make this film. So I said, okay, if you really want to do it, uh, I'm happy to jump on board. And so that's how the whole thing began. Yeah, it, it's really... I love the documentary because, you know, I've been following you, your career for, you know, quite a while. Like, you know, I've been reading your articles, you know, that you posted on Jim Hill, like 20 years ago. Oh, now. My. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, yes, that's you know, right. There, there was stuff, you know, that, you know, I thought I knew a lot about your life. And when I saw this, there was a lot of stuff that I had no idea about. Like I had no yeah. idea that you went to war and that you attribute uh, being an animator and like cartoons saving your life, which yeah, I think yeah. is ex exceptional. Well, thank like, you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, and I gotta, I gotta give a little credit to Jim Hill because it was Jim who encouraged me to start writing about my, my, uh, my adventures in the animation business. I, I had didn't know anybody would have any interest in that aspect of my life. And Jim Hill said, no, no, no. He says, you've got, you've got animation history here. You, you knew all of these famous animators you knew and worked with Walt Disney. You should write this stuff down. So it was really Jim Hill who got me started writing and, and in a way beginning to document uh, my life and career in the animation business. Yeah, I mean, is there any part of your career looking back that you're actually surprised that you were involved? I mean, I could, you know, 
think, you know, from the documentary, like, I had no idea you animated the logo to Soul Train. Like, <laughs> like that yeah, was you know, like... Yeah, well, one's life is sometimes full of surprises. Uh, a lot of things that happen, uh, I had no, uh, you know, they, they just happened. They just, it was part of just my living my life and doing, doing my job. And sometimes there are, you know, some unpleasant surprises, but for the most part, most of the surprises in my life have been pleasant ones, uh, oftentimes unexpected, but they've been great. And uh, I think in many ways, I've been a very lucky guy to have had the opportunity to work on so many wonderful projects, wonderful films, both television and, and uh, feature length live action and animated films. I've, I've done a lot of different things and it's all been, it's all been great, great fun. Sometimes it's been a challenge, but uh, I have no regrets. I've had a, I've had a, a wonderful time uh, during my career. It's just, just been uh, really terrific. Yeah. And you mentioned that this film started off as like a Drew Struzan project. What I thought, you know, even down to the poster of this movie, Drew Struzan, you know, drew the poster with you. Yes, like, how does it feel <laughs> to be the subject of a Drew Struzan poster? Because I know a lot of people, you've yeah. done something a lot of people are trying but have failed, which is try to get Drew Struzan out of retirement. So yes, how does it yes. feel to be, you know, <laughs> alongside heroes like Indiana yeah. Jones and Luke Skywalker and Harry yeah. Potter and so on? Well, again, that was a wonderful surprise. And, and that, Drew Struzan il illustration that was on my movie poster. Uh, I never, never expected that to happen. What happened was uh, we were having a a birthday party. Uh, actually, it was a surprise birthday party because I had no knowledge of it. They had a party for me at the Walt Disney Studio when I turned age eighty, and um, people, you know. They brought me presents, and uh, it was my birthday. And, and Drew Struzan, for my birthday, did this portrait of me. And, you know, as a gift, because he wanted to give me something, and he didn't know what to give me, so he did, he did a painting of me. And then sometime later, when the documentary had been completed, uh, the producers were looking around like, well, what's the poster for this uh, documentary film? And one of the guys said, hey, why not use the Drew Struzan portrait that Drew had painted for Floyd? Why not use that? And so that became the poster of our movie. It became the cover of the DVDs. And uh, it was all through the generosity of uh, my friend and colleague, Drew Struzan. And what an honor. This is a guy who's painted movie posters for guys like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. And, and so many other uh, top filmmakers, uh, Guillermo del, del Toro, and so many, so many famous filmmakers. And Drew has done the poster for their film. And here now I have a Drew Struzan poster for my film. Uh, what an honor to have someone like Drew do a painting for me. And uh, it becomes the poster of my uh, documentary. So uh, again, a very, uh, it's another surprise. Another very pleasant surprise. Yeah, absolutely it is. That's a great story. Yeah. So, yeah, one of my favorite projects that you've, you know, been involved in and worked on is The Jungle Book, which, oh, yes. I, as far <laughs> as I understand, is having a pretty bit, you know, you're going to be traveling for an event related to The Jungle Book. If you right. want to plug it in now, you know, want to talk about that? Yeah, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to visit the Walt Disney Family Museum. Uh, it's located at the Presidio in San Francisco, California. But there's also an exhibit hall at the Walt Disney Family Museum. And the newest exhibition will be a, uh, a marvelous exhibition on The Jungle Book, uh, Walt Disney's final film a film that we completed back in 1966. Ironically, the same year Walt Disney passed away. But uh, Andreas Deja uh, has curated this marvelous uh, exhibition 
of Walt Disney's last film, The Jungle Book, a film that I was honored to work on with Walt Disney back in 1966, and a film that will be celebrated at the Walt Disney Family Museum uh, opening next week. Opening uh, next week uh, up at the Presidio. Those of you who, who live in San Francisco or are willing to make the, the journey to San Francisco, visit the Walt Disney Family Museum and see a marvelous collection of original art from uh, this, this film that was so entertaining and has uh, entertained so many millions of people around the world. It was actually Walt Disney's last film, but a film that I was lucky enough to work on, The Jungle Book. Yeah. What, what would be your big like takeaway that you want to leave guests leaving about either, you know, the Jungle Book of Walt Disney or, you know, just your career in general? Well, you know, I, it, it's kind of ironic that I would end up working on the Jungle Book because I, I had never planned to work on that motion picture. And it, it wasn't even my decision to work on the Jungle Book. It, was, it came from Walt Disney. <laughs> it was Walt Disney who got me on the Jungle Book way back in 1966. Because Walt Disney, I don't know if you know the story, but Walt Disney had a disagreement with his uh, top storyteller, his top writer, storyboard artist, Bill Pete. Uh, Bill had done an adaptation of the Kipling novel, and Walt Disney did not uh, did not like it. He was not pleased with what Bill had done with Kipling. And he wanted to start over again. And Walt Disney put together a new story team to rewrite the Jungle Book. And I was part of that new team of story artists who had to rewrite the movie from scratch, pretty much. And so um, that's how I came to be involved with the Jungle Book. Because it was a decision not made by myself, but a decision made by the big boss himself, Walt Disney. But having been added to the crew of the Jungle Book, uh, I look back on it now and realize another incredible opportunity to be able to work on this remarkable film, but even more so to be able to work with Walt Disney himself. Not many people can say they worked with Walt Disney. Uh, what a what a special treat! What a special honor to be able to uh, be in meetings with Walt Disney over the course of a year. But that's what happened to me back in 1966, and I'm so very grateful that I had that opportunity to work on a remarkable film and to work with one of the greatest storytellers, Walt Disney. So again, another unexpected pleasure. Well. Your time is precious. I know we're about, you know, we're running low on your, you know, very valuable time to spending. But before you go, I have to ask, you know, one big question that sure. I have about the from the documentary. Um, yeah. Do you still quote floiter, floitering, find yourself floitering <laughs> around the studio? Because I know COVID <laughs> has sort of put a damper on a lot of that. Do you still find yourself doing that? Well, thankfully, um, Thankfully, I'm able to floiter again. And, and of course, that term comes from a, uh, a young animator who, who kind of like coined that phrase of floitering because, it, you know, it's a mix of Floyd and loitering. <laughs> so, so when Floyd loiters around the Walt Disney Studio, uh, Floyd is doing more than just loitering. I'm actually floitering. And thankfully, uh, having survived the pandemic, having been uh, cooped up at home for the past two years, thankfully, uh, we're able to return to work. And I can honestly say it was a real joy to be at the Walt Disney Studios just yesterday, where I was able to reunite with many uh, of my colleagues many of whom I hadn't seen in over two years because when the studio shut down because of the pandemic a couple of years ago and we began working remotely, a good many of us had not seen each other in person, face-to-face, -face, in over two years. So it was a real joy 
to return to the Walt Disney Studios yesterday and to continue to loiter around the Disney Studio campus and to continue to carry on a long-standing tradition, and that is floitering. <laughs> so Floyd, it, Floyd is floitering again at the, at the Disney Studio, and I'm so happy to be back there uh, after being away for over two years. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And I want to tell all my listeners, if you happen to see Floyd at either a con or some special event, be sure to go up to him and, you know, you know, tell, you know, cause this guy has had so many great stories. He's got, <laughs> you know, he's got so much talent, you know, he may even draw you something. So Floyd, thank you so much for your very valuable time. I loved hearing all your stories. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been great talking with you. It's been great sharing these stories with you. And like I said, I've been a very lucky guy uh, being at the Disney studio during that very special time when Walt Disney was still with us. I can't think of anything more significant than that. And I'm really grateful for the opportunities I've had throughout my life and my career. So it's been just a real delight to share those memories with you. And we appreciate them. Thanks, Floyd. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.